everybody, what's up Wayworld Outreach? Hope you're doing awesome. Today is Devo time. The Daily Growth Book has been a blessing. It's a powerful book. We made it as a church from the heart of Pastor Marco to all of you to be a blessing, to be a way of walking through the Bible, bite by bite. Because remember, it's not about all the quantity that you're getting. It truly is about digesting the Word, having time to meditate on it, understanding what you're reading, Bible says, in all of your getting, make sure that you get understanding. It's really important that we're taking the time to read maybe five or six verses instead of five chapters. It's, it's really great that we would get all of it. The Bible's packed. It's dense with revelation and life-changing things that we need. And to take your time with the Bible is to take your time with the Holy Ghost. By taking your time with the Holy Spirit, you're giving Him a chance to do the jobs He wants to get done in your life. Remember, the Bible is the Holy Spirit's number one tool that He doesn't just use on Satan, He uses it on you. All the jobs that the Holy Spirit wants to get done in your life, you know, whether it be cleaning up something about your life, purity, your thoughts, all of that, guess what tool He's going to use? He's going to pull out the Word of God. But He uses the Word that's already in you in order to use it to go and to change things through you, okay? So he uses the word that's in your heart, that's already in your mind. That's why we can always get more word. If you don't feel you have enough in your mind, if you don't feel the Holy Spirit's doing anything in your life, it's because you're in a word famine. I'm gonna say that again. The only times the Holy Spirit is not doing things in your life, you're not feeling changes happen, you don't feel breakthroughs going on, you don't feel insight, discernment, He's not speaking to you, is because you're in a word famine almost every single time. There are some times where the Holy Spirit just doesn't speak because He wants you to seek Him, but most of the time it is because there's a word famine. Because when the Word of God is in you and you're constantly in the Word every day, what's going on is you're giving Him the number one tool to use on you. So you'll read this chapter like we're about to read today, 1 John chapter 5. We've already done four, 1 John chapter 4, so we're a little bit ahead, so we're going to do 1 John 5 today. You're going to read it like today, and the Holy Ghost is going to take it, and He's going to put these verses into your life specifically, convict you of some of them, uh, remind you of things He's already told you, but He's going to be using the tool of the Word. And this is what I've noticed about the Holy Ghost. Until you begin reading the Word or saying the Word, you don't start the conversation. So what do I mean? Can the Holy Ghost talk to you at any time? Absolutely. Does He sometimes just talk to us in the car and we didn't expect it? Yeah. Does He sometimes talk to us in a shower and we didn't expect it? Yeah. Does He just talk to us when we're in worship? Absolutely. There are times where He talks, but just get me, let, let me tell you, the number one way He speaks is through His Word. This is the dailiness of the speaking of God. So if you want to hear God's voice, what happens that the Holy Spirit told me is He said, Gavin, the Word begins the sentence and then I end it. So the Word of God is a voice. It's living, it's active, it's still alive. It's a daily revealing. It's the uh, rhema, which means that it's today, a now word. Right now, the Holy Spirit, God's going to speak. So what happens is you begin to read the word and you start the conversation. You allow him to begin to speak. But many times he waits for you to start the conversation by getting into the word, memorizing the word, starting to pray turning worship on. You see, all these are steps that you're taking toward God and you're taking to Him first. We make that first step, right? Draw near to God. And what is He going to do? Draw near to you. Who took the first step? You made the first step. So we're making a step today, getting in saying, Lord, I want you to begin speaking to me. So let's invite the Holy Ghost. This is His Word. This is His book. He's the teacher. We don't want to go to class without the teacher of the class coming to teach us the book. This book we're going to be tested on. We're going to be quizzed on. What's the test? Life. You're going to have life. Life is going to happen this week. You're going to have tests. You're going to have things you're going to have to overcome. You're going to have good things, blessings. Things you're going to have to, you know, lies you're going to have to overcome or promises you're going to have to receive. And, and all this is going to happen, but you want the teacher, the Holy Ghost, to teach you today. So Holy Spirit, we thank you. We invite you right now. We just give you praise as you're speaking to us through this word. Let us know exactly what you want us to know. We acknowledge you as the teacher. Amen. Important we do that every time we read the Bible. 1 John 5, verse 1. We're just doing one chapter, so we get to really get, get into it, all right? Everyone who believes that Jesus is Christ, the Christ, is born of God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. Who's his child? Jesus. Everyone who says they love the Father but doesn't love Jesus, you don't love the Father. Matter of fact, 
If you, and this is what it's the same with the Holy Ghost. I know a lot of churches and a lot of people say, man, we love Jesus, want everything about Jesus, but then they ignore the Holy Ghost. They don't want the Holy Ghost to move. Guess what? You can't have one without the other. It's a trinity. They all come together. You don't want to acknowledge the Holy Ghost, you don't get Jesus. You don't want to acknowledge Jesus, you don't get the Father. See what I'm saying? So that's powerful. Verse 2, this is how we know woo, that we love the children of God. This is how we know. By loving God and carrying out His commandments. Oh gosh. And here's verse 3. And this one's intense. This is intense, guys. But it's in the Bible. This is love for God. So he's saying, I'm going to define loving God. I love God. How many people you said know that? Right? I love God. You do? Awesome, man. Here's what you should ask. Here's what you should be looking for. This is the crux. This is the definition. It, this is the Webster's Dictionary, Bible Dictionary of loving God. This is love for God. Obey His commandments. So love and obedience are the same. Love and obedience are the same. Loving God is not just lifting your hands and worshiping. No, it's obeying what He's telling you to do. Love and obedience in the Bible are seen as one in the same. This is very convicting. I'm convicted right now. Okay. And his commands are not burdensome. Verse four, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. Amen. If you're born of God, born again, remember, born again, you're going to overcome whatever the world's going to bring to you. This is good news. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So your faith in Jesus, what he did on the cross, his sacrifice, John is saying that the faith in that will get you through anything the world can bring to you. Did you hear that? The victory that's going to overcome every single thing the world's going to throw at you. Now, please realize there's, there's different realms we're talking here. Satan is its own thing. We're not talking about things Satan throws at you. The Bible gives a specific way to deal with him. Then there's the flesh, the old man. There's a specific way the Bible gives to deal with him. And then there's the spirit of the world. The thing that beats the spirit of the world, that overcomes the spirit of the world, is your faith in Jesus, what he did on the cross, the faith that you have in Jesus, that he is the victor, that you're not trying to get to victory, but now you're coming from a place of victory. That's going to overcome whatever the world tries to get you. What's the world? Spirit of the world is love of money, love of status, the pride that's trying to come in, the trying to build your own kingdom, that my own ambitions. That's the world trying to get a hold of you because the culture of the world says build your own thing. Why are you serving them? You, you don't got time for that. You got to do your own thing. Life's too short. You got to follow your heart. That's what the spirit of the world says. But the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. You don't need to follow your heart. You need to follow the spirit of God. I can get that's huge advice right now. Don't follow your heart. Well, I mean, I've wanted this for so long. Well, how do you know that's what God wanted you for so long? You got to find this out. You got to find this out. You got to seek the Lord. You got to humble yourself again, prayer and fasting. How do we deal? So that's how you deal with the world. How do you deal with your flesh? You crucify your flesh. You know you can't rebuke your flesh. You rebuke demons. They flee. Bible says in James 4, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he's going to flee. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he's going to flee. Only submitted people have the authority to resist. Let me say that again. Only submitted people have the authority to resist. If you're not submitted, you ain't got no authority to resist the devil. An unsubmitted man or woman, and that means unsubmitted to God's authority and unsubmitted to the authority that God places on earth. An unsubmitted man or woman has no authority to resist the devil. He's playground for the devil, but this is good news. All you got to do is resist him. He flees. Rebuke the uh, demons. Tell them to go. They'll be cast out, but you can't cast out the flesh. You can't rebuke the flesh. You can't have a sermon with the flesh. Only thing that works on the flesh is the cross. The cross is the remedy. You got to take up your cross that Jesus did. He said, now carry your cross and you got to crucify. You got to put that cross right into that flesh. You got to push it in there. You got to, the cross, right? Self-death, crucify it every day. Let's continue. This is good news. We could go a long time on that. Verse five, who is it that overcomes the world? Who does it? Only he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. Every other religion, not going to work. Every other belief system not going to work. Only those who have Jesus are going to overcome what the world brings. See, why? Because it's sticky. The world has some enticing things it wants to bring to you. The culture of the world, fame, status. Woo! It's enticing. But only with Jesus can you overcome that. Verse 6. This is the one who has come by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, 
but he came by water and blood. That's powerful. And it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the Spirit of truth. That's really good. Verse 7, for there are three that testify, right? These, the Spirit, Holy Ghost, the water, which is the Word, and the blood. These three are in agreement. This is one of the most powerful uh, scriptures. I've used it in all my years of preaching. And, and God gave this to me when I was very young. I think it was 18 or 19. And he told me, he said, Gavin, anywhere that you represent and you preach the blood, exactly the Bible says, the Holy Spirit will confirm. Anywhere where the blood is at and spoken about, celebrated, the Spirit will be there. Anywhere that you preach the word, not your own opinion, the Spirit will be there. You see, they're always in agreement. If you want the Holy Ghost to show up, stick to the basics. Preach the word. Don't add anything. Don't take anything from it. Preach the blood of Jesus. You're going to have the Holy Ghost show up every single time. Woo, that's good. We accept, verse 9, man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his son. Verse 10, anyone believes in the son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given him about the son. Verse 11, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Verse 12, he who has the son has life. That word life is the word zoe, Z-O-E, okay, zoe. That is a different kind of life. Physical life is a different word. It means a life that you're going to live for an interim of time. So 80 years, 90 years, 75 years, however long. It's an interim of time. That is a certain kind of life. That's not this. This is the word zoe. Zoe means eternal life, but zoe means eternal life with God. So there's life that you live on earth, and then there's an eternal life that you live in hell. That's a different word. And then there's the word zoe, which is life with God. So anyone who has Jesus has life with God. That's a fulfilling, satisfying life. He who does not have Jesus does not have a rich, satisfying life. That's what it's saying. Verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. This is the confidence. Verse 14, we have an approaching God. So please stop real quick. If you want to have confidence in prayer, it's talking about prayer. People who have confidence in prayer do this. So pay attention. If you want confidence, this is why you don't have confidence in prayer because you're missing this. Here we go. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So what is the condition for God to be able to hear us? This condition for him to hear our request, and that, yes, that does mean that there are prayers that God does not hear. That is in the book of Psalms. That's in the book of Proverbs. For instance, I'll give you an example. The Bible says, if you regard sin in your heart, I will not hear your request. Regard means to love and to accept. If you love a certain sin, if you, will not, if you are unrepented about a sin and you say, well, this is just the way God made me. This is who I am. It's a sin, but now you're calling light darkness and darkness light. You have accepted it and you do not call it evil anymore. God will not hear your prayer. You hear that? Very important. But he said, if we're asking according to his will, he hears us every time. Okay, and this is really good news. Verse 15, this is the, this is the ending climax. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked. So, what he just said in two verses, and I preach this all over the world, how to get what you ask for every time. Wouldn't you know that you'd want to be able to pray and get what you pray for every time? How do you get what you pray for every time? Well, number one, you have to go in with confidence. The Bible says, approach the throne with boldness. James says, if you come in and you're not, you know, you got doubt or whatever, you're like a person tossed to and fro, you're not going to receive anything. So you have to ask with confidence, asking in faith. But many people do not have confidence in their prayer life. They don't have confidence God is hearing them and they don't have confidence they're gonna get anything. Why? Because of these two things. They do not know that what they're praying is God's will. I'm not sure it's God's will. Well, no, long, well, no wonder you don't have confidence. You don't have confidence because you're not sure what you're praying is God's will. If you know without a shadow of a doubt, I'm praying God's will, you got confidence he hears you. Not only that, you're going to know he's going to answer it in his time. He's going to answer it in his time. So if you want to know every single time you're going to get prayer, what you prayed for to be answered, you want to pray God's will. What is God's will? The Bible. Pray the Bible. 
you should never have a prayer life without this thing being included. So many people, for instance, when they do devotions, they read the Bible, they close it, and then they now pray. It's a separate thing. That's not how we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to be able to have our Bibles open while we pray. And what happens a lot of time is the Bible begins our prayer life. So we might read something like we're reading here and maybe something's popping out to you. What's going to happen? Number one, you're going to either get convicted or a revelation is going to happen, but it's going to stir your spirit to want to pray. So see, the Bible helps me pray. The Bible gets me started into prayer. The Bible brings me into God's presence. The Bible brings me into a place where God becomes tangible. I use the Bible to start praying. And then I'm praying out of the Bible and I'm praying God's perfect will every single time. Verse 16, if anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. This is a really deep teaching we can't go into right now, but please understand that there are sins that lead to death and there's sins that don't lead to death. I've no, I don't think you've ever heard this sermon before, but it's a good one. Okay, he should pray that God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. So there's people whose sin does not lead to death. But then listen to this. There is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying that he should pray about that. <laughs> All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. So there's a sin that does not lead to death. You should pray for this person. But then there's a sin that leads to death. There's nothing, no prayers you can do that will stop that from happening. That's a different word. But just trying to get your palate like, what is going on here? Verse 18, we know that anyone born of God does not continue in sin. The word continue means to make a habit, okay? So habitual sin, we're not talking about somebody who cusses somebody out. Oh, Jesus, please forgive me. God, just clean my mouth. I'm sorry about that, okay? That, that's, it. that's people. We slip up, right? We get in the middle of the emotion. And, you know, okay, Lord, God, I know what I did was wrong. Please forgive me, Jesus. I'm so sorry. I should not have yelled. Lord, I need to go repent to my wife again. Lord, I know what I'm doing is wrong. That, that's not who he's talking about. He's not talking about people who sin, know it's sin, see it as evil, say, God, I'm going to need your help with this. They repent. They come back to the Lord. The Bible says for that man, it's that a righteous man, that kind of man will fall down seven times, but the Lord will lift him up again. You see, there's a man and a woman who know what sin is. Their flesh gets involved and they have to get better at disciplining their flesh. They got to use the cross. They got to get more revelation from God. They got to allow and submit their life one part of their personality at a time. They got to submit their finances. Then they got to submit their attitudes. And, and it's, it's going to be a journey with you and God. That's perfectly fine. That person knows Jesus, even though they're still sinning, it's different. They're sinning in a way then then they repent. God's helping them. They're getting rid of the sins. They're sinning. They repent. God brings it up to the surface. He works them through it. This is not that person. He's talking about a person who in habit and in their mindset have said, this is who I am. I do this sin. It's not wrong. God made me homosexual. God made me this way. Um, God just, you know what? It's not anger. I just have a special level of authority. I don't freak people out when I walk around. I don't have an anger problem. I just have authority and people can't handle that. You're deceived, man. You're deceived. It's people who are in total deception and believing that what they're doing is fine. Okay, that's who God's talking about. The one who was born of God keeps him safe and the evil one cannot harm him. So Jesus keeps those safe who are the people who do sin, but repent, know what sin is, know what light is, and God works them through that. God will help you that entire journey. He keeps those people safe. He does not keep people safe who have bought into the deception. Verse 19, and let's end in the next couple of verses here. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Oh my gosh, you gotta understand. Corinthians talks about this where Paul says that the God of this world is Satan. Now this just confirms it by saying the whole world is under the control of Satan. Well, wait a minute. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the... So what are you talking about? I thought God had the whole world in his hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Absolutely. But remember what he did. Adam was put in the garden. He owned it. He created it. But then what did he say? He said, I give authority and dominion over the earth to man. I give it to man and woman. You are to rule it. And then what does he say? Subdue any enemy. Why do you have to subdue? Because there's an enemy here. He's saying, you're going to have to take control of this. You're going to be the one who does this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Why didn't God just heal our land? 
because he gave you the authority. He gave us as mankind. What goes on down here is not his fault. He gives it to us. The evil that's going on in the world is not his fault. It is man's sin. It is our fault. But we can pray. We can rise up as the body of Christ. We can be a light. And guess what happens? As goes the church, so goes the world. Say that again. If the church is not being a light, there is no hope for the world because we are not God's uh, C plan. There is no B plan. There's no D. We are his only plan. The church is the bride and we are the only plan to bring everything back. We are God's A plus plan. The church. And so we have to rise up and say, we're not going to let this happen. We're not going to allow evil to reign. We're not going to. That's what we do. Okay. So this is really important. If we don't do that, it remains under the enemy's control. You see, remember when Jesus died on the cross, he broke the power of the authority of the enemy over whoever accepts him. He did not break the power and authority of the enemy over those who do not accept him. So that's why being saved is different than being unsaved. You are not owned by the devil anymore. You're owned by God. He protects you. You got angels around you. You got all these promises. You got a life that he can guarantee. You got somebody behind your back. He's watching you at all ends. Though a thousand may fall at my left, Psalm 91, and 10,000 at my right hand, it won't come near you. Why? For believers. But unbelievers are still under the control of the evil one. They're ruled by the circumstances in their life. They don't have any control or authority over any of it. You do. I remember, uh, and I've said this in, in, in church many, many times before, I talked to a guy and I said, man, how you doing? I've, I've, I've talked to so many people. And they go, well, man, you know, under the circumstances, uh, I'm doing okay. My question is, what are you doing under the circumstances? You're supposed to be the head, not the tail. You're above, not beneath, you're not beneath any. What are you doing under anything? Hallelujah. Verse 19, we know that we are children of God and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. That is Jesus. And we are in Jesus who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Verse 21 to end, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. So that was a whole other thing. But how do we keep ourselves from idols? It all comes up here when Jesus is the only one on the throne of our hearts. So idolatry is lifting up something else and putting it on the throne of your heart. How do you know you have an idol? What you want to do is take inventory real quick. You want to take an inventory of what you spend the most time on. You want to take an inventory of what you protect the most. You want to take an inventory of what offends you the most, what topic or what thing, what do you protect the most, what offends you, um, and you want to take uh, inventory of what you spend the most money on. So those things, you want to make sure that they're toward the right things. They're not toward the wrong things, okay? So um, if you spend the most money on basketball, uh, your time's toward basketball, uh, it offends you if anybody tries to talk about your basketball crazy habits uh, because you're literally nonstop at basketball. You don't want to hear about it from nobody. And if you protect your basketball career and everything, nobody can get into that space. It's an idol. You see what I'm saying? You can do that with anything. So... You, don't touch my sports games, man. I watch my sports games on this day every single time. Okay, well, let's, let's just, you know, I'm not saying it is, but check yourself. Guys, I love you all so much. This has been an incredible chapter. As you can see, the Bible has so much to say. This was just an overview. We trust that you're going to get many revelations yourself this entire week. God bless you. Enjoy. See you later. Um...